Mr. Herman. Mr. Herman, you have a telephone call at the front desk. <laughs> Some of you may need to ask how anybody like that not only became a cultural icon, but an influential personality to millions in the mid to late 1980s. I've asked myself on occasion because, well, I was one of those millions. You've entered the Gen Experience, I'm Victor, and as the news of Paul Rubin's death circles the planet, I am reminded of ending my Saturday morning cartoon block of fun each weekend with him. The menagerie of puppets, the incredible cast of supporting characters, and the big names who showed up in his amazing playhouse. Join me for a clearer picture in only a few minutes of this legendary talent. Rubens created the character of Pee Wee Herman while performing with the Groundlings, the legendary improvisational comedy troupe, where the likes of Lorraine Newman, John Lovitz, Adrian Barbeau, Conan O'Brien, Phil Hartman, Phil Lamar, Lisa Kudrow, Jennifer Coolidge, Will Ferrell, Kristen Wiig, Maya Rudolph, Melissa McCarthy, Will Forte, and a bazillion others who found themselves on Saturday Night Live, at least for a short time. Many write off Pee Wee Herman as comedy that plays from the boy in a man's body trope. But then you'd be missing the joke. He is simply a boy. Perhaps a bit obnoxious, but fun-loving. Well-liked, but mischievous. Yes, sometimes it seems like that mischievous type of comedy comes from an adolescent boy just discovering the effects of puberty. In any case, it was clear he was not initially created for Saturday morning. Pee Wee Herman's show may have come alive at the Groundlings Theater, but after being passed over for SNL with Gilbert Godfrey and with some money from his first theatrical appearance in Cheech and Chong's next movie, Paul refined the character at the Roxy in Hollywood in 1981. Kids loved him during the matinee, and adults loved him after dark. The show where Paul let go of his self-censorship that afforded him more of the humor found in his contemporary Cassandra Peterson another very successful alumni from the Groundling. Pee-wee may not rely on double entendres like Peterson's iconic own creation, Elvira, Mistress of the Dark, but he played the edge of questionable behavior for a young boy who gets laughs with some innuendo and peeking up girl skirts. Paul Rubens always believed he was entertaining the masses, young and old. He just understood how to play both sides of the coin, and that strategy had him enjoying wide popularity with his live show that parlayed into a special for HBO. It features the familiar characters of Captain Carl, Jombie the Genie, Miss Yvonne, Terry the Pterodactyl, and Clocky, who would be introduced to the world when they debuted in the Playhouse in just a few years. It was that popularity and renown Paul was enjoying that allowed him to wrangle young director Tim Burton to create a film vehicle for him. Perhaps not completely what we think of when we hear his name, Burton created a massive success of $45 million on a $6 million budget with Pee-wee's Big Adventure in 1985, a surreal and trippy parody of the 1948 Italian classic Bicycle Thieves. Going on, officer? We're looking for an escaped convict, ma'am. We heard all about it on the radio. Right, honey? <laughs> Have you seen this man? Ah! Bless him, better heads on boils. <laughs> no, I'm sure I'd remember the face. Honey? No. Would you mind stepping out of the car, ma'am? No, not at all, officer. Some sort of problem? No problem at all. I just wanted to take a quick look at that cute little outfit you have on. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you take a picture? It'll last longer. <laughs> <laughs> you have a nice day. Well, whatever the inspiration, everyone was taking notice, and the rewatchability of that film on both cable and in video rental heaven kept its popularity from waning. And every boy trying to mimic that insanely nuanced voice Paul developed for Pee Wee that had us all in hysterics. Hi, Bob. My name's Joe. A falsetto child? Hey, he thinks he's Pee Wee Herman. If you look closely, you can spot Cassandra, aka Elvira, and one of Paul's closest friends in Pee-wee's Big Adventure as part of the biker gang. Comedians got to stick together. 
It was CBS who swooped in immediately with a huge offer, a cartoon series for Saturday morning. That was an uninspired idea, so it went nowhere. But when Rubens was offered to act, produce, and direct his own live-action Saturday morning children's show, he couldn't resist. And in 1986, Pee-wee's Playhouse would hit the small screen. He had creative control and 325000 an episode, just like a primetime sitcom. Although the first season was filmed in a converted loft on Broadway, the second season would move to L.A. in 1987 and not only get the space they required, but the better working conditions and relaxed environment for both cast and crew. The creative control, that instant fame and recognition, was the very thing that had celebrities excited to work with Pee Wee on his show or off. Getting a Christmas special within two years shouldn't be taken lightly, and Pee Wee's Christmas show rivaled all others at the time. Nothing like Frosty the Snowman, Pee Wee resurrected the extinct holiday variety show and gave us a wackadoo version of Judy Garland's Christmas complete with celebrity guests dropping by or phoning in. None other than the likes of Oprah, Whoopi, Little Richard, Magic Johnson, Zsa Zsa Gabor, Katie Lang, Joan Rivers, Grace Jones, and Cher. Cher, whose cameo was taped in 25 minutes because of her tight tour schedule she was in the middle of, still agreed to be on the show. When you're Pee Wee, you got clout. He even had the likes of Annette Funicello and Frankie Avalon spending the whole Christmas special making cards. Oh, and if you happen to miss all the queer subtext in this special, then you aren't paying attention. This primetime extravaganza blew audiences away in 1988 and was a once-in-a-lifetime event with faces that don't usually appear on Saturday morning fair. Kids couldn't get enough, and teens either. Older siblings would often stop and watch Pee-wee's Playhouse with you, and your parents would sit down wondering what the hell this was all about. And the united laughter around the shared television of the 80s proved the success of Paul Rubens and his creations. While young boys annoyed everyone with their bad imitations of Pee-wee's classic lines or screamed real loud when the secret word was said, they could also beg for some seriously popular merchandise produced at the time. Upholstering Pee-wee would say some of his most memorable lines. There was even Cherry, his comfortable wingback stuffed seat from the show. It didn't stop there. Merchandising and sponsorship deals as well as PSAs. What's that? Major Lock! This is crack. Rock cocaine. It isn't glamorous or cool or kid stuff. It's the most addictive kind of cocaine and it can kill you. What's really bad is nobody knows how much it takes. So every time you use it, you risk dying. It isn't worth it. Look, everybody wants to be cool, but doing it with crack isn't just wrong. It could be dead wrong. You couldn't switch on the set without seeing our gray-suited, red bow-tie wearing big kid in your face. It made sense to have a sequel. Sure, Big Top Pee Wee in 1988 may not have done as well, making $15 million on a $20 million budget and raking in moderate and lackluster reviews then and ratings now. Quite a place you got here. Hope we're not putting you out. Putting me out? <laughs> of course you're not putting me out. But I loved it, and so did millions. It was a standalone sequel and was more of what we loved about Pee Wee Herman. What we all loved, and that is all that mattered. With Penelope Ann Miller and Chris Christopherson serving up their characters completely invested in Pee Wee's world, they deliver every line with conviction and act as if this bonkers premise is as serious as Shakespeare or a big budget romance. Everybody wanted a piece of the Pee Wee cake, and Paul was more willing to serve. Almost never being seen outside of his character's visage, whatever he did, it was as Pee Wee, his moneymaker. And the Mouse House shelled out lots of money in the height of Pee Wee's popularity to voice Captain Rex in the original Star Wars attraction of 1986. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the fun. A classic Disney attraction made even better with the crazy voice antics of Pee Wee Herman as the captain of this runaway shuttle. And Disney even dolled out more money for him and Mel Gibson to be part of the backstage studio tour at the brand new Disney MGM Studios in 1989. Demonstrating the importance of voice acting and sound effects, the two were joined by other huge stars of the time who had their own segments of the tour. 
That is until two years later, when the sound effect portion was unceremoniously and quickly pulled from guest view. I know you are, but what am I? It was 1991 in Sarasota, Florida, when Rubens was observed exposing himself. No one knows if it was Nancy Nurse, Turn Up the Heat, or Tiger Shark that Paul was enjoying his peewee with when the detective arrested him in the lobby. Luckily, CBS had already canceled Pee-wee's Playhouse, but with his Emmy in hand, this would ruin his career. Although police did not immediately know who they had arrested, Paul let them know during the process, and just like that, news of Ruben's arrest spread across the media landscape with headlines like Pee-wee's Perverted Playhouse, and the actor's arrest photo got top billing. It became the story of the summer. Although his statement a few days later refuted the Vice Squad story of exposing himself, the mugshot itself was damning enough and put people off. His toys were pulled from the shelves immediately, and although the outcome of the small, no-contest Florida trial came to a fine and community service, the damage was done. And Rubens knew it. It would be a hard road back. No, nothing right now, Mr. Herman. I'll be in the bar. It's true, there were no offers or roles coming his way immediately after the incident, and many stars would simply vanish. But Paul would unapologetically begin to appear in movies with bit parts, looking nothing like his now infamous alter ego. Like in Batman Returns, the movie version of Buffy the Vampire Slayer and Matilda. Almost immediately, he would make even more appearances in small roles on TV, building up credibility, visibility, and financial stability. Sometimes one episode, occasionally a six-episode arc. Shows like Murphy Brown, Ally McBeal, 30 Rock, Pushing Daisies, The Blacklist, and even DC's Legends of Tomorrow. As well as more Batman as the Penguin's father, the second time he would perform that role. Voiceover was good to him. Anything to regain his reputation, he would take with no grumbling. He was the character Locke from Nightmare Before Christmas, jokey in the Smurfs movies, even appearing on American Dad, and video games like Call of Duty. Without much pomp and circumstance, the character of Pee-wee returned in two sketches for Funny or Die. Pee-wee gets an iPad, and Pee-wee goes to Sturgis, both in 2010. Without a lot of fanfare, Pee-wee was readying for his second big break, and the next level, Broadway. His original show was a live stage show back in the early 80s, so taking on a Broadway stage to reboot his brand seemed logical, and enough time had gone by that there was indeed an appetite. The Pee Wee Herman show on Broadway was a 2011 theater revival of Paul Rubin's character, Pee Wee Herman, bringing the character full circle, not just to the more adult theme of the original act, but simply his roots from the original show at the Roxy, in 1981, the live show that got him HBO, that got him a feature film, that got him a TV series, a surreal homage to his life, performing that nightly show on the Great White Way must have made his last 30 years all seem like a dream. This very show, decades later, was the same one that started it all. Pee Wee was back in the playhouse with all the familiar friends he created and shared his life with. With so much success behind him, and just as much adversity, the talented comedian with one hell of a resume rekindled his career without having to sacrifice who he was. Lifting himself out of the dark, pulling himself through, he rose from something many others might consider career ending, but not the charismatic and effervescent creator of Pee Wee Herman. This week, Paul Rubens passed away from cancer, a cancer he did not share with the public. Having made a Netflix comedy, Pee Wee's Big Holiday, a hysterical buddy comedy with homoerotic subtext for tough leather-clad biker Joe Manganiello in 2016, and he continued to pop up here and there, often uncredited like on the show What We Do in the Shadows, this death was a surprise. Paul Rubens will be missed. He was 70 years old as of 2023, and although he slowed down in the end, with the work he continued to appear in, I didn't see it coming. You are an inspiration to us all. I'll say. I'm going to start a paper route right now. Because of that, I'm sure all of us from a certain generation, and maybe some from more recent ones, will remember this iconic personality. The man Paul Rubens and his creation. The lovable little scamp, Pee Wee Herman. I hope you enjoy the show. There are so many more on the channel you'll enjoy, like this one. Please look around for more and thank you for joining me. Don't forget, help me out by clicking the like, comment on your favorite memories from Pee Wee Herman's past, and consider subscribing for more great content from the Gen Experience. Until next time. You are such a pushover. I know you are.